If you've ever worked on a serialized narrative podcast at some point, it could be episode two or episode five or episode eight, you may have gotten all tangled up. Wait, I think I used the scene where Miss Plum finds the gun in the library in episode one, but here it is again, or did I use it already? I don't know. It's hard enough when you're sure of all the facts. But what about when you're tracking a scammer, someone who lies without compunction, but someone who doesn't always lie? Then you might throw your hands up and say, sorry, this is impossible. That's the situation my guest, showrunner Karen Given, walked into when Dear Media hired her and reporter Sarah Gannam to investigate serial scammer Coco Berthman for the series Believable, The Coco Berthman Story. Coco was a young woman who gained fame and followers by weaving tall tale after tall tale. She claimed to have been sex trafficked for years, after which she gained a claim as an advocate for trafficking victims. She also claimed that her therapist locked her in a basement, that her mother killed her sister, and that she was dying of cancer. After a while, it seemed quite reasonable to assume that Coco lied about everything. But what if parts of her outlandish story were actually true? Today on Sound Judgment, how to solve the puzzle of a serialized narrative podcast when you can't be certain of anything. This is Sound Judgment, where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved audio storyteller by pulling apart one episode at a time together. I'm Elaine Appleton-Grant. If you've been listening to Sound Judgment for a little while, you know I'm on a quest to learn the universal skills and qualities of today's best storytellers. I've learned a ton from this project and from my 20 years as a journalist in public radio and podcasting. If you ever think, gosh, I wish I had a coach to help me with my podcast strategy, storytelling chops, or on-air skills, or just to bounce ideas off of, but you don't want to make a big commitment, I'm now offering one-time coaching sessions. My last client said it was exactly what she needed. It's easy to sign up for just one coaching session at podcastallies.com. Also, a new segment debuts today. It's called Measure Your Podcast. Stick around to the end to hear my great conversation with Paul Riesmendel. He's one of the most experienced researchers in the field when it comes to understanding what our audiences want. Thanks to our sponsor, Signal Hill Insights. Karen Given, it is just the coolest thing that you're here. Thank you for being with us. It is so fun. I'm glad we're able to do this. So, Karen, you are the showrunner of Believable, the Coco Berthman story, which is reported and hosted by your colleague, Sarah Gannam. For new listeners, who is Coco Berthman and why did her story interest Dear Media, the production company that released it? Yeah. So Coco Berthman is a woman who grew up in Germany, moved to Utah, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and started telling the world that a whole list of really, really terrible things had happened to her in her childhood. And it turns out that most of what she said was not true. And the reason why Dear Media brought Sarah and I on to do this project is because Coco had appeared on their flagship podcast as a guest, as someone that they promoted and said, look at the great work that this woman has done. And then Coco got arrested for faking a cancer diagnosis. And Dear Media was like, oh my goodness, we really need to figure out what if this story was true? What if the story wasn't true? Like, we need to set the record straight. That is amazing, actually. And it's every journalist's worst nightmare. Right. So my big plan for episode one was to, like, interview everyone who had ever interviewed her. And most people who interviewed her were like, no, no. It was, it's too traumatizing. I can't talk about that. Or, no, I mean, I, why would I want that kind of publicity? Um, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it ended up being the two hosts from the Skinny Confidential, who are the people who brought us on to do this project, and Chris Hansen, who many people remember from To Catch a Predator, who now has a YouTube show, and he had Coco on his YouTube show, and he was in talks with her to do something far bigger with her when he discovered that her story wasn't true. Oh, my goodness. Every now and then, you and Sarah reflect on, well, journalists do this, good journalists do that. And I'm starting to see this really is an intentional sub-theme throughout Absolutely. the series. Absolutely. Well, we didn't want to do a series that was just all about this person and her being bad right? Like, I feel like there are so many scammer stories out there that just place all the blame on the scammer. Not that she doesn't deserve a whole bunch of the blame, but there are a lot of societal safety nets that we wanted to look at. So we look at journalism, we look at other advocacy groups who were in a position to see that she was lying, that she was doing harm to the industry, but that we're kind of riding her coattails. And so they just kind of went with it, you know? So we wanted to look at all the different ways that there were failures to allow this to happen. When we invite a guest onto Sound Judgment, we ask them to share an episode of their podcast that they either loved or found very challenging to make. Sometimes those are one and the same. Karen shared the third episode of this series. It's called Unforced Errors. There's a link to it in our show notes. Let's take a listen to this clip from the trailer. But something unexpected happened when we started investigating Coco. Sure, we were definitely able to prove that a lot of the things that Coco says are lies. We kind of knew that we were going to find that. But the thing about Coco's story that surprised us, we found there are parts that might actually be true. What was your first step in investigating the story? We had a good head start because there is an investigative journalist in Utah named Lynn Packer. He's like 70 years old. He's kind of mostly retired, but still does these YouTube investigations. And he had investigated Coco and he was just perfectly placed to do it because he's in Utah where she is. He grew up Mormon, so he had lots of connections in the church. He actually did his missionary work in Germany. So he spoke German and he works with radio stations and news organizations in Germany. So he had a sense of like, there are very complicated ways that you have to report in Germany because the privacy laws are so strict. So he had like the lay of the land in all of these sort of complicated worlds that Coco was working in and coming from. He had done like an expose on her that kind of got us the broad strokes of her story, the big, big broad strokes. But it was unlike anything I had worked on, because first of all, not very many people have seen Lynn's YouTube expose. So people haven't written on it and expanded on it. There was the work he had done, and then pretty much everything else is new reporting, right? Fact-checking this thing is a nightmare because none of this has ever been written about anywhere. But yeah, our first step was to talk to Lynn. Absolutely, our first step is to go to someone who has already started the work for us. And we interviewed him, and he's a character in this story, too. And then he started to make a few introductions. So he introduced us to Coco's mother, which was super important because Coco says her mother was her main abuser, right? But he also introduced us to many of the church members who Coco had lived with during her time in Utah. And so did you keep a huge spreadsheet? Yeah. And it's really just like going through and finding any connection of someone who you think you might, who might have known her and calling them up. And it was very difficult because I think when we started this, we saw it as a scam 
that had certainly injured some people financially. But hey, people get scammed all the time and they talk about it. We didn't realize the sort of emotional scam that she was putting people through and how difficult it was going to be for people to talk about this. I think a lot of people embarking on investigative stories, this is a fear. Like, how do I actually talk to someone? How do I persuade them to talk to me? And how do I do it in a way that doesn't create a power imbalance, doesn't feel exploitative? Tell me the story of how you worked with someone who was initially reluctant to speak with you. Mm, gosh, there were so many. <laughs> hey, look, some people said they wanted to talk, didn't want to talk, and that was it. And we're like, okay, fine, great, right? But then there was this whole category of people who would say, I don't want to talk. I just don't want to talk. But can we get on the phone or can we get on Zoom and talk off the record? And so we'd get on these calls, and it was clear that they just wanted to unburden that they just wanted to get it off their chest, but that they weren't sure about using their name or using their voice or using whatever. And I think more than any other project that I've personally worked on, there are people who we don't say their last name because they asked us not to. There are people who we don't even say their first name. We gave them a different first name. There's going to be one person later in the season who we are going to alter her voice because she didn't want her voice to be heard. She didn't want sort of that notoriety. And there's one person who said, hey, look, like we need to limit the scope of this interview. She was just too hurt still by everything that had happened to talk about everything that happened to her. And so she wanted to know ahead of time, sort of what we were going to talk about. And she wanted to say, okay, yeah, that's okay for me to talk about. Or no, I, I just can't talk about that. That's too painful or that's too personal. In my era of public radio, which ended in 2015, it was exceedingly rare to ever use an anonymous source or even do first names or something, like just exceedingly rare. And I think the podcast world is different. Now, I don't know whether public radio is loosening up their standards around anonymity or not. What's your sense of this? I think one of the reasons why it's exceedingly rare in public radio is because there's this idea of how can you, as the reporter, be sure that this person is who they say they are, that their experience is what they say it is, right? Like, how can you trust them if you're not allowed to use their name? right? How can you fact check them if you're not allowed to? All of these things, right? Because Coco was so prolific in her communications, like texts and emails and Facebook messages. And so these people have all provided us with gobs and gobs of proof of what they're saying, right? So their truthfulness is not in doubt because we have all of this stuff to back it up. So I think even in public radio, there are mechanisms by which people can be not identified. And that is one of them, that they have to be able to back up their story with other stuff, with other people who corroborate it, with documents, with, you know, some sort of proof that they are who they say they are and that their story is true. Going back to the trailer for a minute, you're expecting all lies, but now maybe there's some truth. And how do you respond when what you expected to find in an investigation is turned on its head by the actual reporting, which, of course, is far more common than people think it is? Well, I mean, so that's actually why I picked episode three for us to pick apart, right? Because that's exactly what happened when we were making episode three. Oh, tell me the story. So we had finished episode two. It was written, fact check, legal review, edited. And I sat down to write episode three. I wrote a whole draft of episode three. Sarah read it and she said, no, <laughs> like this isn't what we should be saying at this time. It's too soon for all these characters. The story isn't there yet. We got to just throw it away. And 
I was like, I just saw your face. It was horrified, right? Not what you want to happen ever, but it does happen often. But yeah, so like I am a huge fan of planning a series like this. I've got it planned out before I do my first interview. I've done so much research and I figured out the story and I know who my characters are. I know what's going to be episode one, episode two, episode three, episode four. You know, like I've got them all figured out. And in this case, because it's an investigation and because the investigation had so many late changes, like we were under deadline and getting these massive interviews that changed everything. All my planning kept going out the window. Like, nope. (laughs) Like, so fun that you planned that. Not going to happen, right? So now with the draft of episode three in the trash and new information coming in from all sides, Karen and Sarah are in a pickle. Not only does the new information make early information suspect, now they're pretty confused. Because remember, this is a scam story. The main character, Coco, lies all the time to many different people. And if Karen and Sarah are confused, they know listeners will be as well. They can't let that happen because, think about it, when a story confuses you, do you stick around? No way. So, to try to figure out the real timeline, they hop on a call together and retrace Coco's steps and interactions. As they do that, they realize they need to become part of the story. We realized that you, the listener, needed us to sort of suss it out with you, to sort of like go along on the journey with you. So, from that point, we just... Every time Sarah and I would get into these conversations about what should we do next, (laughs) we would record them and use them as part of the podcast. So let's listen. This is from about seven minutes or so into episode three, Unforced Errors. I'm going to be frank. Things like this really get Karen and I worked up because we're trying to answer a very important question. Was Coco Berthman actually trafficked by her mother? It's a question that a lot of people have just stopped bothering to ask. Karen and I talk about this a lot. Videos of her singing Celine Dion songs? Like, who cares? Here we are, like the last two people who are trying to figure out if there's any truth in her story when everyone else just wants to believe that everything is made up. It's just, it's so frustrating. There's no reason to lie about that stuff. And every time she does, it makes it more difficult for us to believe the important things. If she had just been more honest and truthful about herself, she'd probably still be an advocate. (laughs) You know, and instead, like, she brought herself down with these, like, unforced errors. What's interesting about this particular passage is not simply that you included yourselves as guides. This happened, then that happened. We're going to take you along for the journey and make sure you don't get lost. But that you're including how you feel about the subject, not traditional journalism no. at all. No. Right? Not. And you're angry at her. Yeah. Yeah. Why why include this had to have been a conversation about do we include that or not? I believe we should believe survivors, right? Like I believe that we shouldn't just question people who say that these terrible things have happened to them. So I felt like it was really important on the one hand to take each one of her accusations seriously. But then we also knew that we had to acknowledge what we were feeling and what we think the listener was feeling, which is like anger that someone would lie about these things, right? Like if she's lying about Celine Dion, why wouldn't she be lying about being sex trafficked as a child, right? Like I think that's a logical way for people to feel. And so I think we needed to acknowledge our frustration with her to sort of acknowledge that the listener is going to be feeling that frustration too. And like, this woman just lied. Why should I pay attention to anything she says? 
And the reason why is that she's talking about some very important topics. And she's talking about things that really do happen to real people, not the Celine Dion stuff. But the rest of the stuff really does happen to people and that we need to take those sorts of accusations seriously. And that makes a lot of sense because you are walking a very fine line with a story where someone is lying about being a victim of something as horrific as sex trafficking. And in fact, she's accusing her mother of being the primary person who did it. And by episode three, we haven't revealed whether or not there is any truth to that story. Like, there are things that we think might have actually happened to her. It's like needing to acknowledge that this person is lying about a lot of things, but there's still a need to go through and look at them one by one. I think you also do something that is very valuable which is that when you're doing any kind of major story about sensitive topics, big issues that happen to a lot of people, processes that have gone wrong, you have to understand what the regular, typical process is, right? So you found someone in episode three who explains how real sex trafficking survivors often tell their stories in ways that sounded very much like the way Coco was telling her story. It's extremely rare for someone to lie about this kind of thing. So I have worked on hundreds and hundreds of sexual assault and commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking cases. And I have almost never, ever come across somebody who made it up. That's Valiant Richie. That's a great name. I love it. Thank you. You can also call me Val. It's most people call me Val. Val worked for the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And when we spoke to him, it was his job to help the OSCE's 57 member nations do a better job of combating trafficking. Val knows about Coco's story because Coco actually spoke at one of his conferences. She was invited because her story has a lot of believability, like the idea that she was trafficked by her own mother. We see a lot of familial trafficking, both in the United States and in Europe. I mean, everywhere. This is real, real common. They might get some things wrong. The story might change over time as they become more comfortable sharing certain things. There might be things that they hold back and then they reveal and it looks like they've lied, but really they were just trying to protect themselves. So I mentioned that there was a veteran Utah journalist who had done a lot of reporting on Coco. But when he released his YouTube expose, there were survivors who felt that it wasn't very trauma informed because he was finding holes in her story and saying, look, see, that's why the whole thing is a hoax. And they were saying, wait, if anyone looked too closely at my story, they'd find holes too. That doesn't mean I'm lying. So The episode that actually got nixed was all about that. It was all about, you know, sort of survivor stories and how sort of Coco was moving through this world. The problem with the episode was that Coco was doing really terrible things to actual survivors when she was putting herself out there as an advocate. And so it was too early to tell the listeners about all those terrible things. But the reason why I had put that in this spot is because I was very aware of the fact that there were a lot of survivors who didn't want us to tell this story because they were afraid that Coco's story would make people question their stories. And so we really wanted to take the time and say, like, you know, just because Coco's lying doesn't mean that that survivor you met at you know, some event last week is lying. Exactly. And it really struck me that he says almost no one lies if they have been sex trafficking. Their stories are almost always true. And I think that that was such an important thing to put in there because otherwise, I mean, think of the years and decades and decades and decades of women who would go on trial saying, I've been raped and, you know, their lives were torn apart. That must have been extremely, extremely tricky to deal with. Yeah. I think the entire thing is extremely tricky to deal with in that sense. On the one hand, the stories that she was telling can be... They're sensational. Right. Yeah. That's exactly the right word. They're sensational. But we had to be very aware 
the things that Coco said happened to her have happened to people. They just might not have happened to Coco. And so we had to be very careful about the way that we're telling those stories. And some of the stories that she told people, we just decided not to use in the podcast because of that reason, because they just sort of crossed the line from being like, we need to tell this story for people to understand what Coco was doing out there in the world versus are we just telling this story just because it's feels like an episode of Law and Order SVU. Part of what the Coco Berthman story is about is the question of why we believe what we believe and how culture influences why some groups are more trusting than others, sometimes to a fault. In this case, Coco had inserted herself into the Mormon community in Salt Lake City, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, and various church members took her in when she said she had no place to stay. One was a woman named Becky, who didn't just take Coco in, she mothered her for quite some time. I'm going to play a clip, and, and what's happened is that things have gone pretty far south. Becky and her husband decide it is time to ask Coco to move out. They pick a day when Scott will be home, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. But it was the Monday before Thanksgiving and my husband was away. She came in and asked if she could talk to me. I had started to, to set up my Christmas tree. So I came into the room to talk to Coco and she said, well, I told my therapist that I can feel that there's kind of a wall that's forming between us. And I'm thinking, yes, because I've learned to set healthy boundaries. <laughs> She said I had told him that I was feeling that it was time that I needed to move out. I said, we're feeling that same thing. And I I said, I've unraveled some, some lies. And she immediately, like, what lies? This is such a, an evocative scene, in large part because of the Christmas tree. (laughs) Tell me about the decision around the Christmas tree. It's hilarious. I love that you've captured that because one of our readers, she was like, "Eh, I don't think you need the Christmas tree. I think you should get rid of the Christmas tree. And I was like, oh no, no, no. The Christmas tree is staying. Like the Christmas tree is not going anywhere. I appreciate your point of view. I know that you've been hired to do this, to tell us your thoughts, but the Christmas tree has to stay. I'd love to say that I was brilliant in asking Becky about the Christmas tree, but she's a really good storyteller, right? And she knows the details that are really going to make a story. And so that was just part of how she told the story to us. And I did think it was very evocative. Like, she's putting up her Christmas tree day after Thanksgiving, right? Like, (laughs) tells you so much about Becky and that moment. And for me, what a relief it must have been to be like, oh, she's not going to be here at Christmas. (laughs) Right. And simply to be able to picture, you know, what I picture is a very comfortable living room, maybe an older home. Maybe they've lived there for 30 years. There might be like one of those Santa's elf things that you move around, elf on the shelf, on the shelf already. You know, I just made up this entire set because of that one line. But you didn't ask her that. We didn't. But those are the kinds of details I sometimes do ask for, because I find those little sort of touchstone moments to be so helpful in sort of bringing you into the story and and making it an evocative moment. She just happened to like give us that part of the story. She actually is a very, very detailed storyteller. So we probably did five hours worth of interviews with Becky. She's a storyteller's dream. But yeah, you end up making a lot, a lot of decisions about what stays in and what goes out. Which brings us to the very big topic of storyboarding. First of all, let's set out the fact that when you set out to do a serialized narrative series, you're taking on so much. A single narrative episode is complicated. When you have a serialized narrative tale, You have to advance the story between each episode to the next to make sure that people come along for the ride so that it's logical, 
and you have to keep track of the details that you have already introduced. So by the time you get to like four, five, six, eight episodes, there's like, oh, wait a minute. Did we already put the Christmas tree in episode two? Let me go back and check. You know, there's that internal consistency. It is complicated. So now add to the fact that Becky is one of like a million characters. You've got five hours of tape just from her. A lot of people at that point would be like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? I want to cry. I want to run away. Like, did you get to that point ever? I feel like I'm still in that point sometimes. So I am a huge fan of planning ahead, storyboarding, all that kind of thing, right? Like this is what we think is going to go here, what we think. And it was constantly, constantly changing. I was using Trello to storyboard this project and I would go back into Trello and move things around and adjust it. And at one point, this was only supposed to be a six episode series. And then I was like, I think it's eight. And then I went, no, it's 10. And then Coco didn't make it easy because normally you would be able to tell a story sort of from beginning to end. But Coco would, every few months, her relationship with whoever she was focusing on would blow up and then she'd move on to someone else and she'd start the story all over again. You cannot tell this story in order. We're using a lot of chronology. Storytelling is based on chronology, but You can't start at the beginning and end at the end because it keeps changing. It's too complicated, right? Like people aren't going to remember why that moment's important if you tell it in chronological order. Which is part of the trouble with dealing with any kind of scammer or con man or criminal because lies aren't chronological, right? Lies shift and change. So if you know you're going into a story where there is a liar, you know you're going to have to deal with this complication. You plan the storyboard in Trello, which is, you know, a project management software like um, Asana. You can do board views where they're little blocks, right? And I know, Karen, from knowing you, that you love Post-its. I love Post-it notes. Give me the 30-second version of how you use Post-it notes to storyboard an episode. Yeah. So, and I'm using Trello exactly the same way. The only difference is that it's electronic and I don't have to move things around on my wall. But what I would do to storyboard an episode is I would take one color of Post-its for each voice, for each character in the story, right? So each character gets their own color. And I put plot points on them, like story beats. It's not exactly the sound bite that it's I'm gonna use. It's like the concept, right? So Becky and the Christmas tree might be something that I write on a post-it note with Becky, right? And Becky's color. And then I throw them up on a wall. And start moving them around because I really feel like figuring out the order of an episode is figuring out a puzzle. And you just got to figure out where you need to begin, where you need to move to, and you've got to be nimble. And I find like the physicality of moving things around gets me out of worrying about how I'm going to write that transition or how am I going to deal with this piece of tape that the audio is not so great, right? Like you can get really bogged down in all those little details, but those details you can figure out later. First, you have to figure out how you're going to tell the story. And so like throwing it up on a wall and moving things around sort of really pulls in a different part of my brain. It's like the puzzle puzzle part of my brain. Um, And that's how I figure out how to tell a story. That's brilliant. I think um, you just probably helped 3M. They should create a package of Karen given storyboarding (laughs) post-its. They really should. We should get in touch with them. I should. I should. uh, Because the amount of post-its I go through in my life is insane. So in Trello, I do the same thing. There are cards in Trello and I color code them by character and then I can move them around. What I generally do is I put everything in strict chronological order and then that gives me a starting point from where I can decide what I'm going to move around, what I'm going to tell out of order, what I'm going to, you know, foreshadow or whatever. And so if you're doing it on a wall, you find yourself like, okay, now I have to move 20 post-its so that I can put that one at the top. (laughs) Using something like Trello, you can just move it and everything else moves down, you know. Right. Right. 
Let me go to just a couple of lightning round questions. The first is, how has working on this series changed you in a way that you did not expect? I think it has made me much more nimble. I am a person who wants to plan everything, figure it all out ahead of time. Just not possible here. So it has made me sort of stretch those nimbleness skills. The second question is, who would your dream guest be for sound judgment? Okay, so my favorite storyteller is Jonathan Goldstein, heavyweight. I mean, the way he builds his stories and they unfold, I always laugh and I usually cry at least once and I am not an easy cry, but it's always like that sort of good, beautiful cry. It's not the, you know, sad, ugly cry. It's like, oh, the beauty of humanity cry every time. I'm going to have to play this clip for him. I don't even know him to say you have to come on my show. That was beautiful. At the end of every episode, I give you just a few of the takeaways I learned from my guest here today's. For more, visit our blog, the links in our show notes. One, Karen and Sarah set out to tell Coco Berthman's story as more than a basic scammer story. They wanted to investigate the social safety nets that allowed Coco's deception to happen in the first place. It's the concept of preventable harm. What makes for a much richer, more noteworthy and useful investigation is whether, in fact, the harm could have been prevented, by whom, and why it wasn't. Especially with true crime, there's a temptation to tell a good yarn, the sensational story about the scammer. But those stories are one-dimensional. They feel like cotton candy. They taste good at the time, but later you might wonder why you bothered. Two. Avoid creating unintended consequences. One of the most important and interesting lessons from Believable comes from the tricky line that Karen and Sarah walked. They needed to investigate the validity of Coco's stories without casting doubt on the stories of every sex trafficking victim. That could have done significant harm. One way they did this, and I would certainly steal this if I were you, was to establish early on what is generally known about a phenomenon or a process. We need to understand what's typical in order to get clarity on what's not. Three, storyboarding is a visual exercise. Karen is a huge fan of sticky notes. In fact, 3M, if you are listening, please name a line of post-its after her. To get started, lay out your story beats on Post-its on a wall or in project management software like Trello or Asana, trust me, you'll be moving things around for your entire production process. Make it easy on yourself. Storytellers, I told you we were debuting a new short segment with this episode. It's the first of a sponsored three-part series, and I know we're all going to learn a lot. I want to introduce you to my friend, Paul Reismandel. I got to know him because his LinkedIn profile says, I know why and how audiences respond to podcasts. That was catnip to me. So the thing that's always bothered me is that we creators generally don't know this. We don't know how our listeners are responding and we desperately want to and we need to. So Paul will be with me today and for the next two Sound Judgment episodes to help us answer these questions. He is Chief Insights Officer at the audio research firm Signal Hill Insights. So Paul, no matter whether we make podcasts independently for a media organization or for brands and that would include things like large nonprofits, higher ed, companies, for-profit, basically any organization. At some point, we're going to be asked, should we keep making this? And pointing to good reviews only goes so far. Downloads also so far. The bean counters out there need more proof that branded podcasts help. What do I say to my clients? Well, so the evidence that we have so far is that they do. And that's because we've done research. We've done research that surveys listeners who've heard the branded podcasts and finding out what did they think about it? How did they respond? Did they enjoy it? Did they not enjoy it? Do they want to listen to more? 
And this is research that we do to kind of answer these questions, to get at the attention that is paid. That's how listeners pay us back for the great content, right? As they they lend their attention. Paul, you say it's really important to think about the research at the proposal stage, at the very beginning stage of making a podcast. Why? Because you're probably going to get asked the question eventually. That's why. And it may not even be right away. It may not be right in that renewal. But in my experience, at some point, questions start to come up. Making a podcast is a significant investment, especially to do it well. And even when you have an entire team, you know, whether it maybe it's from the brand and organization, maybe you have an agency involved, who are very positive, very enthusiastic, very optimistic about it, at some point, the question is likely to come up. And so anticipating the kind of questions that might come up puts you in a better position to be ready to answer them down the line, or at least demonstrate that you have a plan to do so. The question that's going to come up is, how do I know that this has actually helped Mm -hmm. me? Exactly. So Paul, when I talk to new clients, I say, you've got two objectives that we need to be clear on. One is, what is your podcast going to do for listeners? And the other is, what's it going to do for you? You use, because you're a researcher, you use the term brand objective, where I say, Mm -hmm. what's this do for you? Paul, give me an example of a brand objective. Awareness is a very common objective. And that can be very simple, such as you want people who have heard the podcast to be more aware of your brand, just in general. Sometimes maybe a brand has a particular effort that they want the podcast to to help spread the word about. So perhaps it's equity for women or people of color, and a lot of the content is about that. So we can ask questions around, did people understand that? And did they understand that in relationship to the brand? But also really we look to metrics around, did you find it entertaining? Did it hold your attention? If there are hosts and guests, how do you rate the host? How do you rate the guests? And you can put descriptors such as it was entertaining, it was boring, it was okay, and see how people respond to those. That is fascinating. I would love to know the answers to all of these questions as they relate to sound judgment, as they relate to the branded podcast that Podcast Allies makes. I can't wait to dive deeper into this with you, Paul. In the meantime, What could listeners do to get started on this? So we've gone ahead and set up a special email newsletter specifically on this topic. So just go to measureyourpodcast.com and you can get signed up and learn more. Measureyourpodcast.com. Sounds great. I'm going to do it right away. Thanks. That's all for today. Thanks to my guest, Karen Given. I read her newsletter, Narrative Beat, every month, and I think you should too. You'll find a link in our show notes to narrativebeat.com. If someone recommended Sound Judgment to you, please follow the show now and pay it forward. Share it with a friend who loves learning by example like you do. Sound Judgment is a production of Podcast Allies. If you've been looking for a listener-first, story-first production partner, get in touch. Our contact info is in our show notes and at soundjudgmentpodcast.com. We'd love to work with you. Sound Judgment is produced by me, Elaine Appleton-Grant. Audrey Nelson is our production assistant. Sound design and editing by Kevin Klein. Podcast management by Tina Basir. And gratitude to the rafts of producers, editors, sound designers, and other team members behind every great story. Without you, the world would be a less beautiful place. 